Okay, I think we'll get started. So hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Pinkham and I'm the Exhibition and Engagement Coordinator for the Main Library Gallery at the University of Iowa Libraries. And because we're coming to you today from Iowa City, I want to take a moment to express our gratitude and respect to the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk Nations and to all Indigenous people who have inhabited this area in which we live and work. This fall, the main library gallery in the, in the main library gallery, we at the UI libraries were lucky enough to produce and show an exhibit curated by Natasha Durovicheva and Lisa Gardner about the University of Iowa's international writing program. Natasha and Lisa spent months digging through the university archives and in some cases around the IWP offices for interesting materials to help tell the story of IWP's history. Each item they chose was very intentional, and the selection of these items was quite an accomplishment when you realize how many linear feet of documents and ephemera they examined. Uh, so that's more than 261 linear feet, or 87 yards, for those who would like to visualize that. That's a lot of boxes. Ultimately, the materials on display came from the Paul Engel papers, the International Writing Program rec records, and other smaller collections within the library special collections and archives, in addition to items from the IWP's own files and the library's circulating collection of books by IWP alumni. Portraits by Tom Langdon of a few of the writers were uh, also included. Exhibits in the main library gallery are selected by an advisory committee following a successful proposal, so I want to thank Natasha and Lisa for choosing to embark on this archives adventure with us. And before I introduce our speakers today, I want to mention there will be a virtual version of this exhibit available sometime in the coming weeks, and we'll be sure to share information about that when it's ready. And if you will be around Iowa City next semester, I'd like to invite you also to visit our spring 2023 exhibit in the gallery, which is called Out and About Queer Life in Iowa City. So now to tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Uh, Natasha Durovicheva uh, on the left there, pictured with Nia Hualing Engel, is a senior editor at the International Writing Program and a faculty member in the MFA in Literary Translation. She divides her time between editing, teaching, scholarly work, and translating. She's the editor of IWP's imprint, 91st Meridian Books at Autumn Hill Books, and the IWP's journal, 91st Meridian. She's also co-edited World Cinema's Transnational Perspectives, which is a winner of the Society for Cinema and Media Studies 2011 Award for Best Edited Collections, and the essay collection at Translation's Edge, published in 2019. She's one of the two translators of the André Bazin on, Ad on Adaptation, Cinema's Literary Imagination, which was published this year. And to the right, you see Lisa Gardner, who has been the curator for international literature at the University of Iowa Library since 2020 where she was previously the Latin American and Iberian Studies Librarian. She's worked with the International Writing Program since 2012 and is current, currently the library's lead liaison to IWP. She's also the liaison to Latin American Studies, Spanish and Portuguese, Russian, African Studies, South Asian Studies, and Literary Translation. It has been an absolute joy to work with both of these talented women on this exhibit, and I really want to thank them both for the very hard work, dedication, and willingness to share the history of IWP with students on our campus, in our community, uh, and everyone present here today. So as a reminder, following their presentation today, you'll be welcome to put questions into the Q&A box uh, for them to answer. So welcome to Natasha and Lisa. And I will let them get started. And I think there's a slide just before Natasha starts that has a, an, a picture of the exhibit as well. That's it. <laughs> there's the exhibit in the gallery. Okay, so uh, welcome to Natasha and Lisa. Well, welcome to you all. Um, thank you so much to Sarah, especially, who has had to put up with the two of us uh, uh, working on this for quite a while and, um, and uh, uh, producing this exhibit, which has been kind of exciting to do, I have to say. Um, let me just... So uh, what you see in front of you is... Uh, the most recent picture rendition of the uh, fall residency. This is this fall in uh, 20, of 2022. Um, as you can see, 32 righteous from 30 countries. You see most of them pictured there and a few people have been Photoshopped in who were out that day. 
Uh, but the residency is, this is a representative look, I think, uh, for how it looks to us every fall when the writers um, have been here for a couple of weeks, they all settled in and um, uh, uh, present a you know, wide array of, uh, um, you can see a wide array of faces, types, ages, and it is, that's, that's exactly how we want uh, the, the residency to look, diversity and, and, and a great mix of places, genders, voices, uh, and points of view. Um, here is, this next slide is here to give us just some very basic information about how uh, IWP operates for those of you who may not be familiar with the program. So the program um, was, as the, its title indicates, uh, started in 1967, um, and it emerges out of the Righteous Workshop, which uh, Paul Engel had been the director of since 1942. Engel himself was a very interesting person. One of the many pleasures of preparing this exhibit was that he, um, uh, uh, that the, was to work through Paul Engel papers, Lisa especially did the gi giant work there. Um, Engel was a prolific, prolific uh, writer and memo writer. Uh, you will later on see some exhibits that demonstrate that. And he has been also, he was also a, an early sort of cosmopolitan and globetrotting sort. He'd spent years uh, in Europe, uh, first as a Rhodes Scholar, then as a journalist or as a traveling writer in Soviet Union and in, in Germany before the war, then uh, started the writers or took over the writers workshop in 42. And from the late forties on uh, was keen to invite or make it possible for international writers to start coming to Iowa City. And so the writers workshop hosted uh, hosted writers from Turkey, Korea, Pakistan, Japan, et cetera, uh, on a diverse sort of source of funding ever since 1948. And it was really in the late 50s and early 60s when he started thinking about establishing some more permanent arrangement for them. Uh, uh, the, the, the chief uh, source there was uh, that he organized, uh, initiated 1963 uh, with, the help of Mike Keeley, who was invited from Princeton, a translational workshop where the international students could produce their own work, could find translate food, could pair off with translators from the workshop, the American writers, poets, and prose writers, to produce new work in the, to produce translated work in English. And that core of a kind of a source of translation uh, of, of international and Iowa cooperation is really the the, the the nexus out of which international program emerges in 1967. At that point, um, uh, Hual, uh, Paul and was partnered up with Nia Hualing Engel, uh, herself a distinguished writer and translator, originally from the People's Republic of China, eventually from Taiwan, who arrived to the workshop to uh, herself get an MFA um, in fiction. And the two of them try, organized um, themselves or came up with the concept of produce of of uh, of offering a an arts residency for writers who wanted to come to Iowa not to get a degree not to get an academic not to do academic work but rather simply to come and uh, work together as as a collective uh, in the environment of the Iowas or in the environs and in the atmosphere of the attention to creative writing that Iowa was offering. So that uh, the first cohort arrived in 1967 and they have been coming to Iowa City ever since then, except for the COVID fall of 2020, where we went virtual as best we could, but we were very, very happy to be able to resume in person and, and uh, in spring 2021. Um, so the, uh, the, the IWP is then a three months arts residency for mid-career writers, meaning that we offer them time to write, read, and uh, talk to their partners and, and collaborators, sometimes collaborators, and uh, 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 corresponding friends from all over the world, and also 
to meet American writers and to enrich the international environment of the University of Iowa, both for graduate students and for increasingly for undergraduate students. The selection process is, I one wouldn't want to go into great detail here simply for reasons of time, but essentially our writers come to us from two different sources. They come to us in part uh, through nominations at the US posts all over the world, hence the map that you see on your left. And also they are uh, proposed to us by private funding arts agencies uh, worldwide. Uh, and we collect the full stack of uh, applications sometime in April, read them in committee, rank them, uh, select, and then send out invitations and hope that uh, uh, those invited will be able to make it to Iowa City later in the fall. And um, of course, the essential component of the IWP is funding. And uh, the question of funding is, has been, uh, uh, is always, of course, fraught. The no funding is permanent, chronic, and eternal. We depend to about 50% of our funding, as you could see in the annual reports that are uh, posted on our website, comes from the US Department of State, at least have most recently in the last couple of decades. Uh, it's been a little different in the first part of the program, but it, there's also a, a, a fair amount of private funding uh, from arts residencies, uh, for instance, in Korea, Singapore, uh, sometimes Japan, etc. And um, we're, of course, extremely eager to receive donations. Uh, we have a few anonymous donors who have been very, very supportive. And we also have a small fund called the Paul Engle and Ye Hualing Fund that allows us to bring a writer from uh, a Chinese speaking area and uh, a writer from perhaps from a region that doesn't have a, a great deal of representation uh, on our, by our, our own selection. Um, in, in so far as we are looking at the narrative arc of the 50, these 55 years, uh, it's worth noting that, uh, that the program did extremely well between 67 and the late 1990s, at which point the political climate uh, began to be changing. And so the role of cultural diplomacy that the program was playing from the perspective of the US uh, State Department was beginning to be questioned. Uh, this is what we might call the downside of the peace dividend. The peace dividend itself was great, but it also meant that the United States no longer felt that it had to be quite as um, active in supporting its outreach to writers and cultural workers elsewhere. Um, and at the same time, the, the university priorities were beginning to be rearranged, humanities play, perhaps playing a kind of a different role. Um, and so in that process, uh, the uh, IWP underwent a moment of crisis where it looked like perhaps we might not be able to continue the operation. The wonderful thing, uh, and one really worth underscoring, was that uh, the, the tables were turned in part because uh, the university and campus and the Iowa City community rose uh, vigorously and supported the program and made the case that the program should be continued. And the US State Department certainly agreed with that. So we were able to start a kind of a new chapter, you might say, uh, a year 2000, the new director that sort of replaced the, uh, became a next uh, uh, substantive and long lasting director of the program, Chris Merrill was hired. And at the same time, the continuity with the program was also guaranteed by people who have stayed with us for many, many decades. I, in particular, I want to uh, uh, mention Peter and Mary Nazareth, who arrived to Iowa City in 1977 as a writer and his um, uh, partner uh, um, in, in, and collaborator in his, in his thinking and travels, Peter and Mary Nazareth, and then Hugh Ferrer, who, has been the, who is now the associate director of the program and who's been here since 2002. And the arc of that, this narrative, um, as I will, I hope to speak to briefly um, a couple of slides down, is what we might call the digital turn. That is, at some point, the uh, fall residency, which had been really the core program of um, IWP, uh, had to be had to recognize that the internet has changed the geopolitics, the outreach, the what it means to be physically present to a place, and uh, the program 
in that sense, broadened out, rethought, innovated, and continues today as a kind of a multi-level program uh, in which both the physical presence of the writers in the fall residency continues to be absolutely central, but at the same time, uh, uh, we also have opened up a number of programs that try to reach outwards using the internet, and we've also enriched uh, the core residency by youth programming and other uh, uh, travel programs that take American writers abroad to pair off with our alumni for new kinds of activities. So uh, here back to the uh, glass cases in the uh, main gallery, of, uh, the gallery of the main library. Uh, these are some of the shots that you see, which document both the, on, on your left, uh, the brochures and the memos and the kind of early documentation from the Writers' Workshop, um, spelling out uh, the transition or the kind of doweling of, of the focus on American creative writing and its transformation or combination with international writing. And on your right, you see the, a, couple, a couple of instances of the annual report. The uh, annual report that was all of two pages written on Paul Engel's typewriter in the middle there. And then the annual program of the most recent residency, which you know is considerably longer, more colorful and enriched with many more details. Also importantly are the two photographs. You see one to the right there. Um, that's a photograph from the late sixties where the writers were taken to John Deere uh, the John Deere both factory and headquarters across the river here in Illinois, right uh, to the to the east of the Mississippi River from Iowa. And also the emphasis on the precise location where we are. Iowa has always been, I mean, Paul Engel is a born Cedar Rapids, a son of a horse trader, and he's always been very uh, mindful of the physical presence of the writers to the landscape and to the um, specificity of Iowa. And so until this very year, uh, we continue to receive an invitation from a farm family somewhere in the neighborhood, it used to be the Hemingway family for many years, and also the Dane family. And you see the Dane farm there on the color photograph where the writers every fall are invited to a kind of a Thanksgiving feast and a hayride. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the entire, it would not be unfair to say that between 1960, well, actually between 1942, probably, and 1991, uh, uh, when Paul Engel died, the typewriter, also known as The Beast, was the machine that produced the entire output, that drove the, uh, uh, the international writing program. Paul Engel was an, was an intrepid memo writer and uh, a correspondent. Uh, rumor has it that he would stand at the railroad, uh, at, at the train stop here in, in Iowa City every morning, bringing with him his giant bundle of letters and getting his the giant bundle of correspondence. In other words, the pre-internet era, but the typewriter was kindly loaned to us by his widow, Nye Huang Engel. And we're, this is, I must have to, I have to say that this is perhaps my number one object uh, in this whole exhibit. And here is the, here are some of the samples of what Paul Engel's uh, typewriter produced over the years. I think you can probably see that the letters that come from Iowa have the same time fund and probably the same coffee spills as well. Um, but I wanted to select these and um, include them in this in this uh, um, webinar because they represent um, also the the Paul Engel papers, which are tremendous, as Sarah had just mentioned, uh, many, many uh, 286 line, linear feet, perhaps. Uh, they represent a correspondence and um, documentation that uh, to the diligent scholar will also indicate the different ways in which the program uh, can be conceptualized and the different ways in the pro which the program could have developed. There is now in 2022, a uh, solid amount of scholarship that's coming out of literary criticism, literary history, uh, and to some extent history and sociology document that um, concentrates or focuses, pays attention to um, 
uh, the, the, the rise of creative writing and the role of creative writing programs that, that uh, in the development of American post-war literature. And often scholars that write about international writing program have a kind of a singular focus. Uh, that's, as, of course, inevitable as every scholar does. But if you look at the Engel papers, there is really a massive amount of material that deserves attention because it really refracts how the program was originally organized and the pathways that it could have taken. Um, so to the left um, is a document uh, where from 1964, where Engel is just trying to talk to State Department officers into contributing some funding. This in some ways belies the myth that he likes to he and uh, he liked to put out or as often quoted as just a kind of an imagined idea that comes out of Paul's and Hualing's head. It goes to show that he had been planning this program and had been trying to arrange funding for it for a really long time. Uh, the middle uh, document is uh, a memo from uh, uh, the uh, Institute for International Education, a longtime partner um, in the 60s and 70s that suggests uh, that um, uh, Engel go look for funding for um, African writers elsewhere. Um, uh, that uh, took a long while to find that funding. Uh, uh, next to it is a document where Paul Engel in 1968 proposes that writers, uh, that in addition to the international writers that we already bring to the residency, it might be a good idea to also include a special, two special gr groups of um, United, uh, writers based in the United States, namely African-American writers and Native American writers, which to Paul, uh, in Paul Engel's memo, uh, represent such a different viewpoint on the American realities that they might as well be international writers. And in fact, for a couple of years uh, into the program in 69 and, six, and, and 70, that was the case. And a couple of writers were funded by um, the university and Engel uh, and, um, a, a black writer from Los Angeles, and then a couple of Native American writers as well. And you can find all of those on our website when you click your way through the past residency histories. And to the right, the final document is a document where in uh, 1976, the Engels, now Nye Hualing and Paul as joint directors, uh, propose that uh, just as, as uh, Nixon has returned from China and the opening to China was beginning to be a reality, uh, that the State Department start funding, uh, uh, include writers from the People's Republic of China in the funding. So that did not happen until many, many, many years later, in fact, barely at all. Uh, but anyway, those, these, these documents are just a sample of the different ways in which the program could have evolved. Uh, both in terms of its funding and its orientation and its efforts towards different parts of the world. Um, in addition to the Paul Engel papers, uh, there are also two parts to the IWP collection in special collections here at the library. Um, again, a very, very rich source of uh, materials for researchers and just simply readers. It's just delightful to be able to go into the special collections and look at er these early works. This is what you see in front of you is the collections that we refer to as the black binders. Every year since 1967, uh, the um, program archived or kept uh, two kinds of materials. There was uh, there is the collection of administrative materials where the writer's technicalities, funding, travel, um, other arrangements are documented. Often those folders also contain correspondence with the angles with a lot of fascinating personal details. Um, and then there's the second half of that collection, which is called the Black, the, the Black Binder Collections, where the, the creative work that the writers produced while they were in Iowa is stored. These can be original work. These can be translations from the original work, first drafts of translations sometimes, sometimes many revisions of the first drafts towards even including perhaps an off-print or a mimeograph version of what event what soon came to be published. And sometimes also essays that the writers would produce 
to share with the UI community while they were here. So, you know, you can, if you find the right name and the right, right, right year, you can find essays here about um, by, by an Iranian writer who writes about Iranian literature in 1973 or four. Um, from a perspective before the Islamic Revolution, you can find accounts of the landscape of writer writing in Afghanistan in again in 1970s. Uh, so the, there's a lot of very researchable and generally very very readable materials hidden in these collections. And here's a little sampler just to give you a flavor of what it looks like when you actually open the either the folders or especially the black binders. Um, I just annotated them quickly here. There's a Czech poem there, but dedicated to Cedar Rapids and Paul Engel that somebody attempted a, a very, very, very unsatisfactory translation of, and has it has stayed in this it, it unfinished form ever since. Um, there is a text typed by uh, a first draft of a translation by the distinguished Chinese poet um, Ai Ching, who was here in 1976. This is this is the father of Ai Weiwei. Uh, who eventually came to be known as a kind of a uh, uh, widely known as a conceptual artist and a voice of many of the Chinese artists and dissidents now in exile. Uh, finally, there's a, there's a, also a note to um, uh, from Bessie Head, a writer from Botswana who had a long-standing and very very cordial attachment with the Angles who. Um, uh, supplied money in moments of crisis when she needed to uh, survive in under very, very difficult circumstances. And finally, a sweet little note about uh, being in IWP uh, by and, and writing a note about the Mayflower and Dubuque Street by the wonderful Jamaican poet Lorna Goodison. So these materials are all just, a very, as you can see, a microscopic selection from the black binders. Uh, as mentioned earlier, translation has really been a kind of a nexus and uh, and uh, 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 springboard for so much of the collaboration uh, between the American writers and the international writers while in Iowa City. Very early on, uh, Paul Engel uh, put a great deal of emphasis on publishing, tra collecting, translating, editing and getting published translations from areas that were until then completely untouched. There are, uh, there's a, Lisa Gardinier has in her curator talk a bibliography of works produced by the, uh, published by the IWP, uh, often with the assistance of the University of Iowa Press or Iowa State Press at the uh, University of Iowa Press or by other friendly presses. Um, in, this is in the 1970s and 80s, um, when before again before the internet, uh, the trans. But translation continues till today to be an absolutely central nexus between the writers, the UI uh, uh, academic community, and community worldwide. So what you see here in the slides uh, are two uh, uh, hard cop bound copies there to the right. I think one of them is. Uh, 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 he, a collection of Korean poetry and a collection of Hebrew poetry, both of it, which were areas unknown or very barely translated at all at the time when they were published in the mid 1970s. Um, also visible is a program from the uh, translation uh, Alta Conference of uh, 1980. Uh, no, actually, this one was run from early 2000s when the uh, American Literary Translator and Translations Association um, held a its national conference here in Iowa City together with the participants from the International Writing Program. And uh, a more recent example is the zigzaggy uh, uh, strip of papers that you see uh, to the left in the right, and that is a beautifully produced um, artist handbook, um, uh, artist chapbook of translations by the Mexican poet Manuel Becerra uh, made by um, an MFA student in MFA in translation. That was actually her thesis, Kathleen Archer, who also has been a co-editor with me on 91st Meridian. Um, the uh, Center for the Book 
is often a collaborator on these one-off translation projects that the writers put together while they are in Iowa. And to the left, you see a series of uh, translations of materials that we've commissioned for our project called Book Wings. I'll talk about that a little later, but the Book Wings, uh, the three years of the Book Wings project uh, produce both commissioned original works and translations into both uh, uh, Arabic and Russian, which was part of the design, the way in which the project was designed. And translation of continues as a network uh, many years after the writers leave here. Um, as mentioned earlier, once the internet came in, the program could no longer um, Pre, let's say, a completely cent center itself on the physical presence of the writers, even though the that continues to be really the thing that gives us the, allows us to speak about 55 years of the program's, re uh, program's history. Um, so once the internet came in, um, various ways in which to use the digital medium had to be devised and invented. Um, uh, he, to the right is your a list of just a few ideas that we have that that can be enumerated in this case. Uh, we started early on with um, attempts to teach MOOCs, that is massive online courses. Uh, and in fact, in the few initial years of the MOOCs, MOOC projects in around 2010, uh, there have, we have taught a couple of uh, fiction teach fiction courses and poetry courses that enrolled up to 10,000 participants from all over the world. So they and those were courses taught both by American writers and by our alumni together uh, as a way of extending and uh, both in terms in terms of time and in space extending the uh, res the, 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 the network that had been formed during the residency. Um, we continue till this day to teach digital learning courses, which are smaller courses, often specialized, geared towards one particular country or one particular constituency. We started off by teaching um, a course for women in Saudi Arabia uh, around 2011. Uh, and then, but all, every year we devise two or three courses um, for a specific group of students. Uh, we have taught courses in we teach courses on, for instance, an, uh, nonfiction, uh, fiction and disinformation in Russia. We teach courses on uh, women's poetry in um, Latin American countries. Those have been actually translated to Spanish. We have even taught courses in Arabic, women's writing courses in Arabic with where we localize the course so that we both teach in Arabic and, uh, and translate the use source, source material in Arabic. Um, another program that was devised again to kind of continue, use the internet to continue the core of the residency uh, is, uh, is a program called Silk Roads. That's the uh, brown and gold map that you see in front of you, where the Silk Roads um, are countries ranging between Turkey and Japan, more or less, or were places where our former alumni would core, form uh, small working groups with Young, young writers mentor them, uh, provide small mic micro grants for the, for the local writers to come up with their own writing ideas and also assemble a big website with their own reading suggestions, writing suggestions, recordings from their uh, location uh, and uh, samples of their own work. Another intermediate experiment was, uh, for instance, book wings. Uh, you see a slide, a not very clear one, but still a slide from this uh, attempt to think about how to connect physical location and physical locations in two different places at the same time. Book Wings was a three-year project where we collab where the, the IWP uh, commissioned playwrights from the United States um, to write plays specifically for this project, often around particular themes such as unity and uh, translated them translated into uh, several languages, both Arabic, um, Russian, and Chinese, and then stage collaborations with another live stage in another place. So that we collaborated with a, the um, arts theater in, um, in uh, Stanislavski's old arts theater in Moscow for a number of years, for a couple of years, where the Russian playwrights would perform their own version of our plays, and we would perform either a Russian version, a Russian 
play in English translation or one of our own. So you could still be watching two sets of plays in two different languages or one play in two different languages. There was a variety of different variants of this. We did a similar project together with uh, Baghdadi performers in, um, in Iraq. Uh, we did a similar book wins project in South Africa, again, combining U University of Iowa theater arts department uh, stage with the one in Johannesburg. And uh, so we did one with Shanghai in China as well uh, with its own set of complications. And finally, Whitman Web. Uh, Whitman Web was a project where we um, uh, started off with the premise that as uh, translation can allow us to access, the translation plus the internet can allow us access to places where we haven't been before. Um, this was a project that was initiated in 2012 and started in 2013, when we commissioned a, with the funding from the US State Department, commissioned a translation of Whitman's Song of Myself into Persian. And uh, the be, being that well, Song of Myself conveniently comes in 52 songs, uh, every week we would post a translation in both English and in Persian. Uh, with an introduction and an afterward, an introduction by a scholar and a commentary by a poet, Ed Falsam and Chris Merrill, and with sound recordings both in English and in Arabic. And that was the core of a project that grew up to the point where today we have 13 different versions of Song of Myself on that website uh, with languages like Malay, Ukrainian, two different versions of Arabic, um, um, uh, Chinese, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a project where we really feel that the translation and uh, uh, sometimes our alumni who may be, be the translators or simply the readers uh, are continue to be connected. Uh, and finally, um, the, while we still continue to think about the fall residency as being at the core of our project, uh, uh, at the same time, we have, the State Department has been very encouraging to, um, with the idea of taking our writers, uh, American writers abroad as well. So what you see here are four iterations of that idea. Um, to the left, you see a program of young writers called Between the Lines. These are young writers who come to Iowa City. So here we bring them back to the environment of the fall residency, if you will. Uh, the young writers can be from all over the world, but they also include always American kids. And uh, here the writers spend two to three, these young writers spend two to two and a half weeks in Iowa City working together on being taught in seminars and also working on translation and uh, on new forms of writing and form really lifelong networks often in many cases. We've been doing this since 2005 and the, these writers are still, some of them come back to us as uh, or at least uh, keep in touch with us as fully grown mature writers, but and they continue to form this network uh, uh, through, especially through social media, of course. To the right, right of that image, you see a room in the Dada refugee camp where a, a group of American writers came to teach creative writing to the uh, mostly Somali refugees in northern Kenya in a refugee camp. Uh, uh, this is part of a program called Lines and Spaces, where we bring American writers abroad, combining and uh, pairing them off, often with alumni who introduce us to new environments. Such a program was also um, uh, what you see to the uh, uh, left is um, uh, is a program that we have just finished now in the fall of 2002, where we brought our alumni. In the middle, there is a Burmese alum, um, Kokotet, uh, together with a Polish writer and two Ukrainian writers to talk about the concept of migration and homeland that we have just held in the Polish uh, uh, village of Saini, the home of Czesław Miłosz's uh, uh, the, the, the Polish poet Czesław Miłosz, uh, now a foundation called Borderless Foundation. Uh, and these kinds of international symposia are a way of thinking more abstractly about certain general premises, bringing together again, writers in a particular region and our alums and American writers. Thank you. Hello there. Um, I'm going to speak briefly 
a bit about the library's collections, um, but also I do want to start off with talking a little bit about kind of the design of the um, of the exhibit in that for anybody who's ever done an exhibit, you know that you have to work within the constraints of the space. While it's a very large space, some things are fixed and cannot be changed. Other things are more customizable. Um, so this is the, the view here right now are a collection of broadsides and also of event flyers. Um, there are movable walls that we had to, we could either not use them or if we did use them, had to figure out what to put up on them. Um, and we also, but when you see like glass cases, most of those are fixed. And so there, there are always, um, what I realized in this process is a exhibit is about choices. Every single thing that is in an exhibit is a deliberate choice. Um, and one of my favorite ones is actually uh, the case on Tamaj Solomon's chapbook, Snow in which from the uh, Paul Engel papers and from the tooth press, uh, toothpaste press and coffee house press papers, we snapped together a complete view, not just of the writing and translation of the poems that went into snow, but also of the actual um, production of the book and then its subsequent promotion. Um, that was a really special thing. And it's also something as um, Natasha mentioned, that went into the, that is a special thing that happens here in Iowa City of uh, writers sometimes collaborating with local small presses or book artists. Um, and it's, it's sporadic enough that you can't say it happens all the time, but it's regular enough that it's a pretty rich little tradition um, that does, uh, it's, it creates some pretty unique materials and some, not in the case of Shalaman, but in some writers, it might be their only English translation available. Um, most of my work for this uh, presentation as well, I also wanna mention if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat or the Q&A at this point and we'll get to those. I'm gonna go over briefly a little bit about how IWP is captured by the UI libraries. So. We've mentioned the IWP administrative records. Um, that is over 180 linear feet um, of material that is primary sections are administrative, participant files, every writer up until about 96 and some, in some cases up until the early 2000s has a file. And as Natasha mentioned, that can be very perfunctory about getting their travel and, and funding squared away but it can also be a pretty rich uh, collection of correspondence. Um, and in this case, so it was kind of going through that that I started to realize that one thing we don't really have captured very well is what have the writers written here in Iowa City? And so that's kind of, this whole exhibit has spurred off a couple of little side projects that happen. Um, the Paul Engel papers is over 70 linear feet. And we got that uh, after his death in 1991. Um, there have already been, I think it was six or seven uh, doctoral dissertations and master's theses that have been written out of that collection in, in a variety of ways. Um, we have a number of other special collections, uh, things so like I, I mentioned that the Coffee House Press uh, collection may have stuff that's related to some IWP uh, writers as well. And there's a, a number of other contemporary collections that are really rich in um, sources about the program and about the writers and what they did while they were here in Iowa. Um, naturally, we capture a lot of the digital material and really the, I, I have long maintained that IWP has some of the most complex collections that we have in the library. They touch a number of different departments and um, IWP is also one of the most uh, productive in terms of digital output. Uh, we collect the audio or video of the readings and panel talks. They submit a writing sample that is posted online. Um, so that's uh, harvested off of online. Uh, Back in the early mid 2000s, uh, we really, it was one of 
the university library's first digitization projects for AV material was to go through the physical media that's in the Shambaugh House basement and get that digitized, which is now probably an, on its third platform for a digital library hosting. You can see a sampling of that as the image on here. Um, and we continue to collect that as it comes in. Um, really the bulk of the international writing program collections in the library are in the circulating collections. If you're able to see the exhibit or when it, uh, the virtual version is available, um, the front case of the, of the gallery, what I think of as a storefront case, uh, is what we have so far identified as material that is by or by writers written here in Iowa City or uh, about Iowa City. Uh, it's becoming kind of a running joke of how many um, poems are written about the Iowa River, um, which is an astounding amount, frankly. Um, and um, But as of now, what we do with the circulating collection, so we do try and collect many of the writers as comprehensively as we can. That depends on availability, both on our side of funding, but also what we can actually get. Some countries are naturally easier to collect from than others. It's not very hard to get a book from Mexico or France. It is significantly more difficult to get a book from Burma or Ethiopia, and also then to catalog the, um, and process the language. Um, but so far, not just what we have been buying intentionally, but also the material that we have gotten over the decades. It is, we're up to nearly 19,000 volumes uh, that we have identified as being um, by, I, by or about IWP writers. Um, that is, we uh, do have a local subject heading that identifies that and that we also retain the covers. Uh, so there's some special processing involved. Uh, most of those 19,000 are available um, circulating. I would say that, and it's really, that is a known undercount. I would hazard a guess that it is probably a lot closer to about 25,000 items as we continue to identify what we already have as being part of um, IWP. Um, with that, um, for I'm not sure if there's anyone uh, who has been through the residency in the audience. If you are and you uh, did write something here in Iowa City or about Iowa City, we do want to know about that. Uh, the link there will um, take you to a form that you can tell us what you did. Um, but other than that, if you have questions, we are happy to take them. And thank you very much.